And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Molly Murray, hypnotherapist and creative mentor who during her near-death experience saw the light and sensed the presence of angelic beings. Molly, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Molly, if you don't mind, let's start on the day that you had the boating accident and go from there. I was on a pontoon boat with my family. We had some relatives visiting, and so we went to a beautiful place to enjoy a beautiful summer day. We lived in Montana, and so we went to the Gates of the Mountains, which is um, a beautiful, very historic point that's in um, Montana. So it's a point where Lewis and Clark, if you're familiar with the explorers, they came up Missouri, and then they came to this pass between the mountains and um, came in this channel. And it's very, very beautiful, very dramatic looking. It's um, just this deep tunnel of water in between these two very high cliffs. Very beautiful. And the water is a couple of thousand feet deep, which I always think is interesting. And so we're we were passing in between this point, and at a certain point, it opens up and it looks like gates opening, almost like in the Lord of the Rings. I think that happens too. So we were in this channel, and um, the driver of a speedboat didn't look before turning, just turned, raced right into us, hit the side of our pontoon boat, flew into the air, and fell on my head. And that was kind of what started my entire adventure. From there, um, family all, you know, were, were scared I was dead. They weren't really sure what was happening because there were a lot of children and family members on board. And so I think it was just chaos of hoping everyone was alive and safe and worry. And um, they got to the dock and a helicopter met them who took me to hospital in Great Falls. I was in an induced coma for 10 days. And during that time, I believe I flatlined. And that's when I had this near-death experience. So would you say your last memory was witnessing the accident? Actually, it's interesting. I've gone over this so many times. My last memory was we were coming off of the docks. We were going through this beautiful lake. And I lost my hat. It blew away in the wind. And so we went back to pick it up. And um, picked up my hat, put it on my head. And I thought so many times, you know, it was such a freak accident. I used to go over this in my head. Um, what if we hadn't turned around? We wouldn't have been there at that specific time. What if we had just gone on? But that is the last memory that I have. Um, my family was kind of all sitting in a circle. I was wearing a lavender tankini. Um, I don't remember what the hat looked like, actually, but... That was the moment we were all just relaxed, enjoying ourselves. And then um, that was before we were in the channel. So I think that's when my memories just kind of stopped. And um, always been kind of thankful that I didn't have further memories. But um, yeah, I did a lot of deep diving to go back to that moment. And that's kind of where it all begins and where it ends. So you have some of that memory there. And then I guess your next memory is you wake up in a realm like heaven or in the light or what? Well, it was very confusing. So I had several memories actually from being in the coma. I would I had several very kind of confusing, disturbing dreams. And I remember kind of being over myself, seeing myself, seeing other people in the room working on me. Like out of your body. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing a, talk, a, a clock ticking. Um, things like that, and not really understanding it, it kind of looked like there was a big coffin or a freezer that I was in. Um, and talking about it with my parents later, I understood part of um, the process being in this coma, they had to induce it. And they put me on ice to reduce the swelling in my brain. So that explains, you know, you kind of seeing this freezer. Um, but I really, I didn't understand it. It was just all kind of images reported in my mind. And then one of those was this experience of, um, you know, I, I can remember the sense of sadness, not being able to find my parents. 
And um, of course they were right there, but you know, I couldn't make that connection. Um, but then I have this memory, which I wasn't sure was a dream or not. It was all so real, you know, it was a very real experience. So it was more like a memory of a real life experience than a memory of a dream. And I could tell, even when I woke up, I could tell the difference between these experiences of the dream and this um, experience of going to heaven. And I believe that's when I flatlined because I remember just this vision of coming out of a very dark space, kind of walking through a tunnel, but there was a light leading me on. So I walked closer and closer to the light. And I knew when I got there, I could sense um, the presence of Jesus and the divine and angels all around. And, um, and I know that I came back down and at the time I had a real sense of sadness and disappointment that I had come back to my body. You know, there was a sense that I wanted to be gone and I didn't know why I had come back. And that lasted with me for years and years. Did you have any emotions while you're there? Like you were feeling super happy or you were in, you know, an amazing amount of love? Oh, you know, while I was with the divine, I felt an incredible sense of peace. You know, that whole experience, I had a beautiful, powerful, just depth of peace. I feel like the word peace isn't even solid or substantial enough to cover that feeling. Um, it was just this very deep sense of the divine, a deep sense of everything is all right. I'm taking care of. This is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And this feeling of the eternal and of everything just being perfection at that time. You know, it was all meant to happen. I had a very deep peace about everything going on. And I felt so loved, just surrounded by love and full of love. Um, and I could tell I was, I was sensing the presence of love. You know, as I walked closer to the divine, it was like closer to light, closer to love, and just completely enveloped and filled by it. You know, it's just this very deep sense of presence. It was really beautiful. So were you told to come back or forced? No, no. Um, I chose to, and I didn't understand that until years later, because what I remembered at the time when I woke up, I remembered these in kind of segmented memories, and I wrote it down in a journal because I wanted to remember everything. And so I remembered going up, sensing the divine, and then, um, you know, this this amazing feeling of peace and presence and love. And then I remembered coming back down and it was like, and the sense of sadness that I was happy to be alive, but at the same time, I was sad that I had chosen to come back and I didn't understand it. Um, and then years later, when I did healing over this moment, that's when I realized that my soul had chosen to come back, that my soul had realized that my mission was not accomplished and that I had more to do on this earth and that I consciously chose to come back. But until that point, I really, really just wanted to be dead because to me, it was such a wonderful experience, honestly. And so I actually fantasized about suicide for years. Um, and that was part of the recovery process was, you know, having all of these suicidal fantasies, um, or I should say that was part of, you know, just the after effects of this injury, this severe traumatic brain injury, was having all these suicidal fantasies. It was also, um, I believe, an effect of a medication I was on that was since banned. Um, and now it's back on the market under a different name, which I think is just criminal because it gives people these suicidal fantasies. But that is all that to say, I had these, um, you know, just this kind of longing and fantasization about suicide until I was kind of in a happy life, married, the love of my life. Um, we had our child and I was always like, why does part of me, like, I'm so happy. I love life. I've created this. Why is part of me wanting to be dead? And when I did healing over that, I realized that it was that teenage self who was just so, so sad and wanted to be dead. And I, I found her, I went and met my inner child from that time. And she just felt so abandoned and so lost and so wounded. And I actually had to let her go. Like generally we talk about healing the inner child. I'm a subconscious healer. 
And so that's what I love to help people do is heal this inner child. And in this instance, it was actually healing to let that teenage self, that inner child die. And with that kind of ended my um, fascination and fantasy with, about suicide. How do you access the inner child through hypnotherapy? That's right. That's right. I lead clients through a process. Um, I do RTT. It's rapid transformational therapy. So we um, go into a regression. Um, hypnotherapy is just actually a, a very natural state of mind. It's the alpha or theta state of mind that you naturally go into in meditation or when you're kind of waking up, falling asleep, you know, that drowsy state is also the state of mind you're in during creative flow, you know, that process when everything is just working and you're effortlessly creating. And so I lead people into this through hypnotherapy and we do a regression to go back and heal that inner child. So we go through memories and um, it actually took me quite a lot of healing before I got to the stage of going to the boating accident and healing my inner child during that point, because there were so, so many different layers of healing that I had to do before that. Do you think that you could actually be hypnotized to remember those lost memories of the accident itself? Oh, I absolutely believe that. Um, it's funny, I've never tried to do that. I um, I never felt like I really needed to. It's almost like I can envision it. Like we had been in that place before, so I knew exactly what it looked like. Um, and I always thought, you know, it was a real mercy that I couldn't remember it because it was so traumatizing for the rest of my family. And I was like, well, you know, with all the trauma that I went through, I went, there were so many things. I was like, at least I don't have those images in my mind. And I don't have that kind of sense of impending doom that we must have all felt at it crashed upon us. You know, just, I don't have that sense of terror around this at all. And so I just was never really tempted to go relive that. I'm not trying to talk you into it, but <laughs> I think it would be possible that you could have even had an out-of-body experience during that accident as well, because many people, when they're severely injured, they leave their body just before it happens. Oh, I think you're absolutely right, honestly, because, and I'd never thought of that, actually, to, to be honest, but I think maybe that's why I don't have that trauma surrounding the actual moment um, there's plenty of trauma surrounding the other experiences I went through after, but, um, there was nothing, I don't have any kind of associations with that time. And I think that's why that it would make a lot of sense that I wasn't in my body at that time. Um, and also just understanding the spiritual world and who I am as a spiritual being, that seems to make a lot of sense as well. Now, when you say you notice the presence of Jesus and angelic beings, did you see them around you or you just kind of felt like their energy was near you? I could see them. I didn't see their faces. It was more like seeing shapes and I knew instantly exactly who they were and I could feel their energy. Are you or were you Christian? Yes, yes. Um, I was deeply um, Christian at the time in a faithful community. And now I've actually um, deconstructed from the church, but I'm still a Jesus follower, if that makes sense. Like I still believe in Jesus. Um, I just do that outside of the church and kind of have my own faith, sense of faith and, and what I do. Since your experience, have you noticed that you have any new abilities that you didn't have prior? Well, that's also an interesting question <laughs> because before this accident, I was a very, I was kind of a genius child. I was um, in, extremely intelligent. And at the rate I was going, I was homeschooled, but I did all the sort of standardized tests. And so um, I was extremely far ahead for my age and taking college classes at age 15 and planning to graduate at 16, that kind of thing. And so um, after that, I actually lost so many intellectual abilities. Um, math was extremely difficult for me. I mean, it still is. I'm just not, don't have a very mathematic mind. And that used to really, really bother me. It was very traumatizing 
to come back to life. And I had to relearn to read, relearn to write, play the piano, do math, kind of everything. And that was just this huge sense of loss of identity. Um, but to get back to your question, I think through all of that, finding my way through being a neuro neurodiverse person, um, I found several abilities that I didn't have then, but they're more like I see my superpowers as a neurodiverse person. I appreciate and understand and love myself the way I am. You know, I don't have um, perfectionism anymore. I've healed from that which before I was a real perfectionist. So I think I'm a much deeper person. Um, and I doubtless, I mean, I've tapped into incredible powers of reserve and strength that I had no idea that I had. So I think that counts as, you know, a talent that I definitely have. What about abilities that could be considered psychic? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I was actually very spiritual before, so I was very open to psychic abilities. I think I've honestly had that kind of my whole life. Um, I, I remember when I was seven years old, I had this experience where um, we were living, we lived in this house for like six months. So it was kind of an in-between house when we moved to a new town and it was haunted. And the lady who cleaned house for us told us that she'd seen it too when my mom mentioned sensing a presence. And we were all kind of spooked out by that, but different members of my family would hear doors closing um, and footsteps when there was nobody in the house. And we didn't like certain rooms of the house because we could just feel this kind of dark presence. So anyhow, in that house, I remember falling asleep upstairs in the attic or the loft space and um, just having the worst nightmare of my life. And after that, I seem to be very, very aware of ghosts and presences around me. And then after the boating injury, this was kind of on hyperspeed. And um, it was kind of like, I felt like the boy in the sixth sense who sees ghosts everywhere. And they were haunting me. And um, that was played into also this um, suicide ideal idealization as well, because um, I was like, this is awful to live with all of these spirits and ghosts around me it's terrifying because one moment I could be talking to you like this and the next moment I might still be talking and acting like I'm present but in my mind I was being hunted by someone I thought was real but you know was actually a hallucination or a spiritual being um and so that was a really difficult time and that was one of the the hardest parts of the aftermath of this TBI was working through those presences. Um, and so I think it definitely heightened those abilities. And it also heightened the spiritual sense of just eternity is present, you know, where, and I, I've always had this sense that like death is the last adventure. It's not the thing that people fear that it is. It's not scary. Um, but it's also very present with us. And I've kind of, I guess that was very open to me as well as the spiritual world of just seeing other beings. Earlier, you mentioned that you had not fulfilled your purpose. What is your purpose? So my purpose here on earth is just to, to really help people step into creative flow and to find the power of creative flow in their lives. Um, you know, we live in a world that's really difficult to live in right now. It is not easy or friendly for neurodiverse or deep and spiritual people to live in. You know, there's a lot of big structures and um, parts of society that are just difficult, you know, and and still have the systemic oppression and injustice going on to so many groups. Um, so life is just really unfriendly to most minorities of any sort and that includes um anyone who's not very very wealthy i think <laughs> and so part of that is that um we live in a difficult world and i believe that we are creating a new world and every time a creative person acts on their dream and creates something it is really soul inspired and whether you believe that is an outer presence of the muse or whether it's an inner muse that's inspiring you I believe that it's completely from the soul and you need to follow that 
and to create your dream. And when you do that, you are creating a new world because you're creating new ways of living and doing and dwelling in this world and making the world a better place for yourself and for everyone else. What would you say are the common obstructions to most people's creative flow? Oh, so um, I would say that the things that usually come up, well, one is a big sense of um, not enoughness or that leads into fear, you know, fear that they aren't good enough um, and fear of putting their work out there because it's scary to be visible. And um, this usually comes from just not feeling enough in their childhood, you know. Um, I would say that another one is a huge sense of the rejection wound. Um, so many people grow up feeling a deep, deep sense of rejection that they aren't good enough, that there is a reason that they're outcasts. And um, particularly when you're in the neurodiverse community, but then again, this goes to any other community too. Um, if you've been bullied as a child by your family or people outside of your family growing up with any kind of um, narcissistic relationship, you probably have this sense of being rejected. And also, not only that you're rejected, but that it's also your fault. And if you are a creative adult who's listening to this, you may not, you may look at yourself and be like, yeah, I was rejected and it's not my fault. And here's why and why and why. But deep down, your subconscious actually believes that it's your fault because when you are a child, someone else told you, you know, we're not allowing you to be on the same, same level as us or to be part of our group because of this. And as a as a very, you know, intelligent ad adult, you could see that and be like, that's so silly. You could, should never believe a bully. You should never tell a child that. But your inner child still believes that. And so that's number one. Um, you know, fear of not being enough. Number two, the rejection wound. And number three, I would just put in all of these kind of creative blocks that we experience. It looks like ADHD. It looks like symptoms of trauma. That would be like perfectionism. It would be um, procrastination. It would be um, any of these different um, experiences have that we, when we want to create something, but we just feel like it's hard to get it out there. There's some kind of internal or external resistance. That's usually um, an after effect of trauma. And we've all been through trauma. I actually, I don't believe in big T trauma and small T trauma. It's all trauma because our subconscious processes it the same way. When people hear that I've been hit by a boat and some of the things that I went through afterwards, um, they're often like, oh, your trauma is bigger than mine. But you know what? Their subconscious doesn't think that. Their subconscious just knows that they were bullied as a child and it wasn't fair. They were pushed away for no fault of their own. And so it comes out in these different, um, these different effects that are that are holding you back. And so I would say that's kind of three generic reasons, but it all comes down to healing that inner child so that you can do what you're here to do. Um, a lot of times when a creative block comes up, it's there for a reason. And same with manifestation blocks, any kind of thing you feel that is a block in your path is there for a reason. Because when you walk through that, through that block, you overcome that resistance, you heal that deep, dark inner wound that's causing it. And that's how you become the person who accomplishes those dreams and the person that you're meant to be. And so if you're feeling a block in your way, that block is as meant for you as your dreams are. Because when you walk through that, you become the person who can accomplish your dreams. Do you fear death at all? I really don't. Um, I think that the only thing people fear is really that sense of the unknown. I think that death is very uncomfortable. It's like anything, any other growth stage we go through, it's uncomfortable. It, um, we it's scary to go out on the other side because we don't know what's there. Um, but I think if you've got this deep presence, a sense of peace about yourself and the divine, you know, there's absolutely no reason to be afraid. And I think that the only thing that causes people to, to have fear about it is not having this sense of peace with themselves or with the divine, if they believe in a divine, but it all comes down to having this deep inner peace. And we get that through healing. 
And so when people are willing to go through that journey of healing themselves, whatever they believe about the afterlife, I just believe there's nothing to fear after that. If you had a friend that was suffering over the loss of a loved one, what kind of advice would you give? Oh, I would I would just give them a big hug and, and tell them, you know, it's so difficult because as, I, as I'm talking about these growth stages, it's interesting because we start out, we kind of expect these growth stages when we're young, you know, and, and you see a child growing up and you're like, oh, that's difficult. They're going through a growth stage. It's uncomfortable. And you forget that you have them still as an adult. Um, and so number one, that person was growing into the next, the person that you lost was going into their next stage of growth and you're going into your next stage of growth without them. So number one, that's going to be uncomfortable, painful, and difficult. Number two, loss is loss. You need to give yourself the time in the space to grieve. You need to honor that loss. You need to honor yourself and the love that you have for that person. And when you do that, you'll fall, probably feel a lot of comfort um, grief takes time and every journey is different, but when you can have peace about that grief and um, your body doesn't process it as trauma, then it's a much easier transition, you know, because when your body tra processes something as trauma, then you're going to have the bitterness, the regret, um, that kind of deep wounding that you never get over. But when you're able to heal those inner wounds, then you'll be able to have peace about that. And I truly believe that that's what everyone wants for the people they leave behind. So I think that the best thing you can do to honor that person is first to respect and honor your grieving process. And second, to heal your inner self so that, you know, you are at peace with that loss and you know that they are in a better, in a better place to use that phrase. What inspires you about your NDE? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, it's really shaped my entire life. There's um, there's not a point that I can go back and say this wasn't a part of this, which was the hardest part of it for me to get through it was that it, everything in my life was colored by this, was shaped by it. I could never get away from the trauma of this until I did the deep, deep healing and um, so, I mean, I was probably, I was 35, is 20 years when I finally felt very, very peaceful about it um, and realized, you know, this was, this all happened exactly as it wasn't meant to be here. And part of it was doing that inner healing of um, realizing I had chosen to come back and complete my mission. But realizing that inspires me every day. Um, seeing the challenges that I traveled through inspires me every day and just seeing the miracles that happened inspires me. And that's what I want for everyone is just to realize that miracles are so possible, not only possible, they're actually very likely, you know, when you believe in miracles and the people around you are praying for them, um, like miracles are just a huge part of life. They can happen to us every day. And um, so seeing those miracles in my own life and has just inspires me every day. My husband and my son have also had those near-death experiences as well. And so I just believe we're a family of miracles and that everyone can be that way. Miracles aren't rare. You know, everyone can have their own miracles. Can you talk a little bit about the aftermath of the near-death experience? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so waking up, and coming back to this earth was very, very hard. That was not easy. It was not smooth. Um, I had to relearn everything, as I mentioned. And I had to live for a long time with these, you know, a, a very severe case of insomnia. I also didn't get my voice back for over a year. I could only speak in the tiniest little whisper because of the tube that was in my throat and um, I was just in really, really severe pain because a boat had fallen, fallen on me. And so my body was just wracked with agony. And so coming back and not being able to enjoy the experiences I loved as a teenager, also having the awkwardness of um, suddenly being a person who couldn't remember 
names and places or who said silly things after I had been, you know, a, a girl who really prided herself on her intelligence and um, the things I was doing in the places I was going in the world. That was very difficult for me, um, as well as just all the experiences of that were both miraculous and difficult. Like um, I'd always thought we'll get a scholarship to an Ivy League university. And then I um, went to college not knowing that I could, you know, everything was just an experiment of like, let's see this and go further. And my parents were really, really amazing in encouraging me to try everything, to never let limitations stop me and to just keep going everywhere that I could. Um, because when I woke up, the doctors had no idea how far I would go. It was a very experimental procedure they tried at the time. And even to this day, you know, people tell me all the time about their traumatic experiences that they or their family members have had. I've never had anyone tell me anything to the extent that I went through that they survived. Um, so the, the doctors told me that I would probably only reach a seven or eight year old level of maturity. And so my parents just always encouraged me to go as far as I could. Um, and so that was just the most difficult part of my life. And I just encourage people to keep going, whatever they're going through, you know, that there will be an end at some point, like we have seasons in life and there are beginnings and endings of seasons. And so you will get to the other side at some point. But what really brought me there was the power and magic of creative flow. And as I mentioned, I I found out later on, much later on as a hypnotherapist, that this is the same state we're in during hypnotherapy, during meditation, when you can actually access neuroplasticity and rewrite your neural pathways, recode your brain. And so for me, what this looked like was I couldn't do the things that I did before after I was recovering from this accident. I couldn't play tennis. Um, I tried to go skiing, but it was a real disaster. So I couldn't enjoy athletic sports. It was very difficult to be around people because noises hurt my ears and all of it just gave me the most excruciating headaches. It all felt like um, it just pure agony. And so um, what I did was I read and I wrote and I played the piano bit by bit. And I realized as I did this, that I could find a sort of escape maybe for just 10 or 15 minutes as I did these activities or as I did, you know, art artistic endeavors. And so I realized that my best ticket out of this absolute hell that I was living in was to give myself what I now know is creative flow for just every day that I could, and then to expand this in my life. And so as I went on and experienced this, just the trauma of the aftermath of this injury, I, um, I, that's how I began coming into creative flow. And I just expanded this into every part of my life. But that's why I believe that I came so far and that I recovered. And that's why I'm devoting my life to helping people bring creative flow into their own life. Because when you access the state of creative flow, absolutely anything is possible. That's when you can make miracles happen in your life. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Oh, absolutely. They can find my website on flowmagic.org or send me an email at um, molly at flowmagic.org. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want people to know about? Well, right now I'm um, creating resources for starving artists because as I said, it is my life goal to help people create. And it's also my life goal to help artists to thrive in every way. Part of this is creating wealth for artists. Part of it is helping them go through those blocks and create the visions on their hearts. And so I've got lots of resources on my website. And um, this is just my big mission right now. I also have a book about my experience. It's called Today She Is. And um, published by Whip and Stock. 
several years back in 2014. I actually took it out of print because I didn't align with the publisher anymore. They had some decisions that I didn't really align with. But um, I think you can still get it on Amazon or um, email me and maybe we can sort out because I, I still have a few copies left. Well, you do own a bookstore, so you might have some there for sale, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And I hope that anyone who's listening who is in the UK orders their books through Seahorse Bookstore. We really would appreciate everyone who can ordering their books through us because it goes to support a really thriving community here. Do you find that there still is a lot of interest in bookstores? Absolutely. It's it looks really different from um the kind of interest you might expect, I guess. It's a very it's it is a niche audience. It's people who crave community, who love the um experience of coming in and chatting and love the experience of a physical book. And so it's actually a completely different audience from people who read on Kindle. We also have a lot of people who stream audio and you can stream audio through us as well. But um, I find that the people who come to a bookstore are people who want that experience of talking to someone and the tangible experience of sitting and holding a book, which is actually really different from holding a Kindle. It's just a different way of imbibing stories, different audiences. And so um, I find that we we cater a lot to the people who love community. And so that's why we um, we have book clubs and I love the discussion. I'm actually... I'm beginning an online book club. So if anyone wants to write me at molly at um, flowmagic.org, they can join that online book club because I'd like to make this accessible for everyone because the community that we have through reading and through talking about books is so deep. We find that you go you go places that you don't get to in you know years if you're having a normal relationship or just met on the street. But if people walk into the bookstore, there is something about the magic of books. They have a real energy that just opens people up and we get to very spiritual places very soon. Um, and books are just these incredible, magical, energetic beings. I, I truly believe they have a power that, you know, I'm just discovering. We've owned this bookshop for almost three years and my husband and I are both just very aware of the energetic power of these books. Um, people who walk in always mention it. You know, they feel like they're in a sanctuary when they come into a bookstore. I think people feel like that wherever they are. You know, when they walk into a bookstore, there's just this sense of peace. And I think it really is the power of these words, power of these stories. And I would love to explore this further about how books are their own energetic beings. but. I don't have a, a real theory on that. I just have a sensing because I can tell the miracles that happen around them. Well, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Absolutely. I hope that everyone who listens to this just goes for it and creates the dreams on their hearts to see what synchronicities unfold and that you really, truly expect miracles in your life. Molly, thank you for your message, and thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara Podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the Join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.